The circumference of the Earth is 24,901 miles. Our guest today has swam a grand total of 54,750 miles to date. That's like swimming around the globe two times. Esteemed Mr. President, esteemed Mrs. Reagan, ladies and gentlemen, comrades. Last summer, it took a daring American girl by the name of Lynn Cox a mere two hours to swim the distance separating our two countries. On television, we saw how sincere and cordial the meeting was between the people, between our people and the Americans, when she stepped onto the Soviet shore. By her courage, she showed how close to each other our two peoples live. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash. Throughout her life, dog lover and super swimmer Lynn Cox has been making waves. She swam the Nile River. She swam around the Cape of Good Hope. And she swam more than a mile in frigid Antarctic waters. Lynn Cox was also the first person to swim the Bering Strait. And that journey and how she made it happen played an instrumental role in opening the border between the then Soviet Union and the United States. But what about dogs, you're asking? After all, this is DPN. Well, I'm getting to that. You see, Lynn has a new book, it's published by Knopf, called Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog. As an American long distance swimmer, Lynn is no stranger to the danger of open water. So when she watched a video of a chocolate Newfoundland leaping from a helicopter into the water to make a rescue, she knew that she had to learn more and get involved in a way that only she could. Lynn Cox, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, James. I'm so excited about talking with you. I first heard your name decades ago from Mikhail Gorbachev. Oh, my gosh. Tell me how Mikhail Gorbachev came to talk about you at the White House. I was trying to open the border between the U.S. and Soviet Union and worked on it for 11 years and was able to get approval from Gorbachev to swim from Little Diomed Island to Big Diomed Island in the Soviet Union. And it took five hours and six minutes in 38 degree water and swimsuit cap and goggles. And when uh-huh. I finished a couple of months later, when President Gorbachev and President Reagan were meeting at the White House dinner, President Gorbachev stood up and toasted the swim and said it showed how close to each other the two countries are Little Diamond in the United States and Big Diamond in the Soviet Union. And it opened the border between the two countries. And it was your intention to do that. How old were you at the time? I was 30 years old. And I had worked on it for 11 years and had written to four Soviet premiers. And it was finally President Gorbachev that gave the okay for it because of his policy of glasnost and the idea of openness and trying to bring the U.S. and Soviet Union closer together. So in a real way, this idea that you'd been, you're responsible, or at least in part, for the coming together into Reagan and Gorbachev of the Soviet Union and the United States. Actually, I started working on the project in 70, 1976, and I got the approval from President Gorbachev in 1987. So it turned out that it became the right time for it. But when I initially started with this idea, it was way before This was a time to try to open borders and to try to reach out. And I think the big thing was that the Soviets then were really very supportive of citizen diplomacy. And that's what we were doing. It was individuals seeking ways to reach out and connect to bridge the countries. So you were so ahead of your time as you're here, right here in 2022, and look back on all the things that have happened in the ensuing years. What do you think? You know, I think that that swim across the Bering Strait was one of the most significant things I've ever done because it really did open the border. There were airline flights that started going from the Soviet Far East to Alaska and back again. There was an international land bridge park that was created. There was trade and goodwill and political openings that happened after the swim. And I think that the idea that this could spark other things, in fact, people in Germany told me that the swim helped influence the Berlin Wall coming down. 
Mm. So once one thing opened, there was this effect that people saw this possibility and realized that something more could be done. And so it was very conscious for a young woman at the time to kind of think that your athleticism, because you were, you weren't an Olympic swimmer, but you had, were you ever actually in the Olympics? I wasn't in the Olympics because I didn't have any events that were long enough for me. You know, when I was... <laughs> there was no pool big enough no, for there you. Wasn't, there wasn't really, there was not a mile swim in the Olympic Games for women. So yeah. what my goal was at, at age 14 was to swim across the English Channel. And I did that with the intention of breaking the world record for men and women. And I did that. And then Davis Hart... The first time you tried. Well, yeah, but it was, it was I had had great coaching. Don Gamble, who coached, would eventually coach four Olympic national teams, U.S. teams, was my coach. And he was willing to take workouts from the pool for his Olympic athletes and apply them to me so I could swim in the ocean and train that way. So I had terrific coaching. And my folks, you know, would walk the beach with me. So if I swam four miles or 10 miles a day, they would be helping to set the pace for me. So, you know, that was a huge goal, and I broke the men's record and women's record when I was 15, and then my time was broken. So I went back and swam the men's. And then I realized, you know, there are people that go and swim in this channel over and over and over again. But I realized that there are other things to do in life and things that have never been done before. So I started doing stuff that was really exciting and interesting. Not that the English Channel wasn't, but it had been done. People knew how to do it. They knew how to get boat support. And there had been... Three men who had swum across Cook Straits between the North and South Island and New Zealand, but there hadn't been any women. So that became my goal to try to become the first woman to swim across Cook Strait. And it was a much more difficult challenge than I ever imagined. So you said the genesis of all of this started way back when you were 14 years old. Tell me about that. My parents moved my brother and two younger sisters and me from New Hampshire to California. So we would have more opportunities with swimming, but also that we would have more opportunities in life. Mm -hmm. And so the day that we arrived in California, we went to the Belmont Plaza Olympic pool and it was sort of like walking onto the field of dreams. You could see the, the kids <laughs> training. You could see Olympic athletes from all around the world in that pool. And it was just like, this is where I want to be. Although at that point, I was probably one of the very slowest swimmers in the pool. <laughs> really? Yeah, but it was also, they were doing sprints in the pool, and it was Don Gambrell, the coach, that recognized that I had endurance, and that when people were beginning to fade was when I was really starting to pick up. So I did a rough water swim off the coast of Seal Beach, and entered the women's division, and wound up winning and getting third in the men's division when I was 14, and realized that this was great, that I could actually do well at something, and it was more exciting than going back and forth lap after lap in the pool. I mean, when you swim in the ocean, things are always changing. And you have to adjust your stroke. You have to adjust your breathing. You have to be aware of where you are in the water. When you swim in a pool, you can pretty much just go on autopilot. There are those little lines right underneath yeah, exactly. Right in the tile. Exactly. Yeah. So when you were 14 years old, when you guys moved to California, did you have a dog at that point? Yes. Actually, when we moved to California, by that point, we had a miniature black poodle named Beauregard, who was the family dog. And he was somewhat of a swimmer, but he didn't really love the water. We had other dogs prior to that. We had a, a Dalmatian named Beth, who was a terrific swimmer. And in fact, she really loved to lifeguard the family. You know, make sure that we were all herded, all in the shallow water. Uh, and actually, she would grab my mom by the wrist to pull her toward shore if she felt like she was in danger. Very talented dog. Yeah, very talented. Very smart. So have you always had dogs? Always. I think it was partly because my dad grew up with friends and neighbors that had dogs. He didn't have dogs himself, but he loved them. And there was a doctor named Dr. Jewell who had a Scotty who was my dad's favorite dog and they would Dr. Jewell would take my dad along with him for country rounds he was there to experience what it was like to do medicine in the outer country and to use a lot of sort of holistic medicine back then and so the Scotty dog would be there with Dr. Jewell and my dad and the dog became good friends and so I think that that was the genesis of my dad loving dogs and then passing that on to my brothers and sisters and me. So 
In terms of the remarkable things that you've done in your life, what role have dogs had in terms of influencing you or, or modeling how they act? You know, I think that what I really had with the dogs is that it's a constant companion. No matter how you've done in the day or what's gone on, the dogs, they're happy to see you. And you're the best person in the dog's life. And so, you know, to realize that I really wish I was more like my dog, you know, <laughs> that you can shed all the tensions and just be happy. And so I've been so lucky that through my lifetime, my folks have had many different breeds of dogs, but also where I grew up in New Hampshire, there were neighbors that had all kinds of dogs. And so they became my friends just as much as my human friends. You know, I'd want to go see Mrs. McQuinney because she had dachshunds or up to see the Feltons because they had an English pointer and each dog was different. Did you end up, because of your passion for swimming, did most of the dogs end up like being water dogs when in fact they were not actually bred for that? Yes and no. Uh, we had Italian greyhounds and my parents believed that they needed to be water safe, just like the kids in the family. So we worked with them in the pool to try to have them learn where the stairs in the pool were. How did, how did that go for the greyhounds? Not well at all. <laughs> they, were, they were such heavy-boned dogs and so lean that they would just splash like crazy. And they'd, get, they'd swim in a circle and they'd get lost and we'd have to pull them out of the water. But we also had a Labrador named Cody who was my best pal. And he absolutely loved swimming in the pool and in the ocean. And I remember the first time I adopted him from a neighbor when he was six. Mm. And the first time I took him to the ocean, he just sort of was like, okay, hey, this is great. And he went out and sort of just went under the waves and started swimming. And I just thought, this is the coolest thing that he already knows how to swim. <laughs> Don't have to teach him. So it was clearly meant to be that the two of you would be best friends. Yeah, it, I think so. He was... He was sort of um, not getting much attention hmm. after the first three years of his life mm -hmm. because their owners wound up having twins. And suddenly the dog was put on the side of the house instead of in the family. Mm -hmm. And I asked if I could walk Cody. And so after three months of that, they asked me, do you want Cody? And I said, absolutely. And he became, you know, part of the family. He used to watch basketball games with my dad and dramas with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> it was the perfect dog. Now, you've written about the loss of your parents and Cody in a, in a previous book. Right. And those were obviously, you know, three really big losses right after one another. Yes, I was totally depressed and sad and uh, my health declined really rapidly and my heart stopped working right. And actually, I wrote a book about um, my first book was called Swimming to Antarctica about, you know, swimming in the channel and the Bering Strait and all that. Well, this book was called Swimming in the Sink. And it was, my heart was in such bad shape that I couldn't swim any longer. All I could do is put my hands in the sink and move. And so to get me out of my depression and to help me feel better, first I got medical attention and, and my heart came back and I reinvigorated my health. But one of my closest friends, Sandy, had a golden retriever named Roxy. Mm. And so they would invite me over almost every day. And Roxy would come over and sit next to me on the couch or put her head in my lap and just let me pet her. And I mean, it sounds kind of like, oh, boy, but it made all the difference. I mean, just having somebody there that was warm and soft and furry and happy to be beside me, it sort of eased the pain of all those losses. Oh, dogs are the best medicine, and sometimes just their head in your lap can can make all the difference in the world. Yes, just they yeah. absorbing your pain and also emanating their love and unconditional love for you. Right, right. Did that experience with those dogs inspire you to kind of investigate all sorts of other water dogs, including the Portuguese water dogs that you write about in this new book? Actually, they did all those experiences of swimming with dogs, being with dogs. But I also have friends that have Newfoundlands. And I grew up with neighbors that had Newfoundlands. And the place where we lived in New Hampshire had a huge doghouse that had, had Newfoundlands in it. 
And I didn't realize that. So it's not Portuguese water dogs. It's Newfoundland. Newfoundland's, I, but I, yeah, but I, the Portuguese water dogs are just as great swimmers as the Newfoundlands. And yeah. so I just happened to be watching a video on online and saw some Newfoundlands leaping out of helicopters into the lake Izio in northern Italy, and they were rescuing swimmers and they were training. And it wasn't just Newfoundlands; there were golden retrievers and Labradors of all colors and German Shepherds and a number of other dogs. And so I was so fascinated with the dogs because I just thought, you know, first of all, how do they train the dogs to jump into a helicopter? How do you make sure that they're not afraid? Right. You know, maybe the loud noise will scare them. Maybe it won't. How do you train them to know that there's somebody in trouble and that that you need to go over with the owner, the dog and the owner need to go over and rescue someone. So I was immediately intrigued by, you know, how the dogs, the Italian water rescue dogs are training and just decided that I need to go there to find out. So that's what happened. So you went to Italy. What was the name of the school? The Italian School for Water Rescue Dogs. And the, oh, I, you, I was going to make you say it in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was afraid I'd mispronounce it, so I decided I'd do it in English instead. Okay. That's why I didn't say it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah water rescue. So Donna Pasquale was the vice president of the school, and Ferruccio Pilenga was the man who started the school, and it was his idea to start this whole thing. And I wound up meeting with Donatella and spending time with her and seeing how she was working with her young two year old. Newfoundland, whose name was Al. And Al was a female dog. She was big and strong and beautiful, but she kind of wasn't getting what she was supposed to be doing. Unlike the dogs we were talking about, this is a dog who just was bred to do this, but not so much. The key is that Donatella was totally patient with her. And I saw that not only with Al, but with the other breeds of dogs that she worked with, that she knew how to adjust her training, or I would call it coaching, to the dog and to the owner that she was working with. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it wasn't about the dog. It was really about how the owner was approaching the trainer. And so there was coaching that came from Donatella, but also Ferruccio. And it was really fascinating to me because I could relate to it in a huge way because of being an athlete and a swimmer and trying to become an elite athlete and reaching you know, my huge goals and then seeing these dogs, and I felt like they were amazing elite athletes as well. And the commitment that people had to work with them, to train with them, because the dog didn't only have to be in shape, the owner had to be in shape, and they had to be lifeguards as well, so that when a rescue dog leaped out of a helicopter into the lake, the owner would follow, and then the dog would swim over to somebody that was in trouble and present the handle on his or her harness, and the human being would grab on the one that was in trouble. And the owner would also make sure that the person was okay and the dog was able to pull the person into shore. The thing that I've been asked a number of times is like, why don't you just go with a lifeguard? Why do you need a dog to do this? You know, it's like, wow, I hadn't thought of that. But Newfoundlands can pull in six people at one time. So they're incredibly powerful swimmers, really. And, and a Labrador apparently can pull in two people at a time. And then you have the additional person who's the owner, who's a lifeguard, who can help as well. And the other thing that I thought was so fascinating was that the dog that's doing the rescuing gets close to the human being that needs to be pulled ashore, but keeps a distance at first to make sure that the person isn't panicked and also isn't terrifically terrified of dogs because they're in some Middle Eastern cultures, dogs are not revered. Right. And so I thought, gee, you know, there was so much sensitivity and concern and thought into how to train these dogs so that they're helpful to people and not make a situation, make a situation better, not worse. And tell me a little bit more about Al and, and, and the relationship that you fostered with Al. Well, first of all, she was the first brown Newfoundland I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. So she she was just, to me, exotic and beautiful, and she had yellow eyes. And, you know, it was the first time that I'd spent time with a puppy before. I mean, two years old, it's not really a puppy, but in many ways she still was. Mm -hmm. So I 
remember just petting her and feeling the outer coat and her inner coat and thought how she was made to survive the cold waters off Newfoundland and off Canada, that she had this inner coat that kept her warm and the outer coat. And so just being able to physically feel what she was like. And then she sort of looked at me with adoration in her eyes, you know? So it's like when you get to meet a dog that just likes you, <laughs> it's instant friendship, you know? And so we wound up doing a number of training things together, but I was also invited to go watch when she was going through a series of tests. And during those times, Donatella was just working with Al to make sure that Al was doing whatever she needed to do during the tests. But during the training in the lake in Northern Italy, we just had fun. I mean, just, it was really cool to realize that she was just starting out like a newbie novice swimmer and to have her come over to me and, and realize that she was supposed to give me the harness and I held on. You know, it was, it was really cool. So in putting together this book, you really kind of did a deep dive and learned a lot more about the breed, including a lot of previous history of how Newfoundlands have saved a lot of lives throughout time. Yes, there are stories off the coast of Canada where there are a number of, of Newfoundlands that have rescued people. And there are stories even off the coast of England. There was a Newfoundland named Bill Bow who for years was lifeguarding I think around Cornwall, I'm not sure, but he was there with his human mm -hmm. watching the water. And I think what made me so excited about the story was that the dogs were sort of dogless and the people were peopleless, that they were not selfish people. They really were doing this to help other people. And they were spending their free time patrolling beaches and training and getting to places on their own dime. And I just thought, you know, people need to know about this group. And they need to know how, how good they are, you know? Can you recount the story? There was a dog, I think, that saved like 160 lives. Harry Man. There was a dog, the Newfoundland named Harry Man, who there was a, a ship that was going along the coast of Newfoundland, rammed against some rocky head, and the ship sank. And a young woman and her Newfoundland and her dad and brother went out in a dory and saved people and brought them to shore. And the dog played a huge role because he was unafraid. He jumped into the water and brought a line from the dory to shore. And then people were to, able to go hand over hand to get to shore that way. So there's a lot of stories, though, in Canadian culture that deal with the Newfoundland, where the dog originated from, except there were, prior to the Newfoundland, there were other ship's dogs that came from Spain and from Portugal and from England that wound up being on Newfoundland and Labrador that eventually became Newfoundlands and Labradors. But these dogs are just so strong and so fearless. And you read these stories over and over again about how much they've participated in saving people's lives. And I think part two is, you know, you're asking me, what's this influence? Well, you know, my brother was a Long Beach lifeguard. My sister was a Huntington Beach Light State lifeguard. I lifeguarded in the pools. And so I think that having that sensibility to, you know, I, could, I go to a beach now and I'm watching the water and I can't help it. And I think that's what these dogs are doing too. They're, they're watching the water and making sure people are okay. That is awesome. So now when you go to the beach, it's just habit. It's part of a function of like, you're just going for a day at the beach, but you're just looking out just because it's your nature. There have been four or five times where I have been with a friend and said, can you hold my shoes and my car keys? And I'll just go walking into the water and pull a kid out of the surf because he's being pulled out by a rip. It's just... You should come here to Hawaii and spend some more time here. We need that. Well, Hawaii is a whole different story. You know, the lifeguards there are amazing. And you've got the problems with the coral reefs and the huge waves and mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, much more hats off to the lifeguards there. The jobs that they do are incredible. Well, let's talk about water safety. And this kind of is a nice connection. You have done some pretty ridiculously dangerous, brave things in the water, but you're also very cognizant of water safety. Actually, yes. You know, when I do these different swims, I've spent sometimes a year or 11 training, figuring it out, 
finding support crew, finding people on board that can help me if there's an emergency. When I did a swim in Antarctica in a swimsuit cap and goggle, I was trying to swim the first Antarctic mile and the water was 32 degrees. So on board the boat, the ship, were three physicians yeah. who were friends who went through a drill of what to do if something went wrong. But we also had three Zodiac boats in addition to the major support ship that was there taking us down to the peninsula of Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So on board the Zodiac boats was one guy in a dry suit. There was another guy with a lasso ready to throw it and put it onto me and then pull me into the Zodiac. So mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time figuring things out. And one of the things that I wrote about in this book was also about dog safety around water. Because most people just think, oh, I can just go away, leave the doggy door open. It's okay if there's a swimming pool and the dog will be okay. Well, there have been more than a handful of friends that I know that have lost their dogs because the dog drowned in the backyard pool. And so one of the things that I thought was so good about what I saw in Italy was that the dogs are all wearing vests that are flotation vests, and they have the handle on board above them for you as the victim to grab on. Mm -hmm. But now I'm seeing in Southern California, especially if somebody takes a little chihuahua or terrier or even a Labrador out on a stand-up paddleboard, they have these harnesses with the handle on, on the back of the dog. Because just like a kid getting conked on the head, a dog can have the same thing happen. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really great to be able to say things have evolved and maybe it's not a good idea if you have a pool to leave the doggy door open when you're gone. Maybe you've got to make sure the dog has a harness on. Maybe it's really important to teach the dog where the stairs are in the swimming pool. Because that's what I also learned from Donatella in Italy was that dogs, when they fall in a pool, get totally confused. They can't see the steps. They don't know where there is. They don't know where to get out. So, in fact, with my yellow Labrador, Cody, I spent a lot of time showing him how to get to the steps to get out of the pool. Because often you'll see a dog fall in and start circling and circling and circling and then trying to hold on to the edge. Right. And then they start to sink underneath. Right. And some pools don't have steps that are even accessible without a ladder. Right. Right. And so those pools in particular, you've got to be super careful with your dog mm -hmm. to make sure... They're okay. You can never be too careful around water. We are going to take a quick break right here. But when we come back, we will hear about water rescue dogs and the book that Lynn wrote about her adventures with Al. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life and the next, and the next, and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. Welcome back. Now, seeing this dog in his amazing rescue video took you to Italy. What else did you learn in Italy? One of the things that I learned in Italy was that the people there absolutely adored their dogs. Yeah. But 
They also love sharing food with them and having picnics after the training sessions. And so it was. That's what I enjoyed about your book. As someone who's a dog lover and a foodie, I love that you, it was really a love affair for the Italian food. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, when you travel, I love to travel to experience new things and to discover stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, architecture, food, art, dogs, whatever, because you can stay home and see what you know. But when I was in Italy, the people that were working with the Italian water rescue dogs would have these big picnics afterwards. And one of the things I was exposed to was Parmigiano cheese that I think was 50 years old and different kinds of vinegars and different kinds of foods. And it was so much fun to sample these things, but also the dogs get to sample some of the cheeses. <laughs> dogs like the, parm. The dogs love yeah. the parm because it was really salty. And I actually asked my host, you know, do you feed them Italian cold cuts? And they said, absolutely not. I'm like, why not? They said, well, because all those meats are cured and they're cured with a lot of salt and that can cause kidney damage. Mm-hmm. And nitrates. And, yeah. So I thought, wow, that didn't even occur to me, you know, but I, I think it was just such an incredible experience to be with the dogs, to be with the people, to have picnics and, and try different specialties of northern Italy. You write very eloquently about the food. I think, you know, the thing that I admire about the Italians and that we in the West can learn a little bit is the whole concept of la dolce far niente, the sweetness of doing nothing. Yes. And how the Italians have really embraced that. And then you write about how they're experiencing that with their own dogs. Right. Uh, You know, but so much of it reminded me of being a, a kid and swimming with a team for two or four hours a day, and then going home and being with family and at night and having a meal together. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of what I was used to. But as an adult, I've swum with open water swimmers. And so our routine has always been do a long cold swim, finish, and then go somewhere for breakfast or bring things and share things. And so this routine was something that I was so familiar with. And it may It gave you time to socialize and to learn and to talk. You weren't just done with a workout and gone. And that's what I thought was so nice about being in Italy with this group. Mm -hmm. Because they were sharing what they knew. They were telling me about their different dogs. I mean, there were people that were very proud of their their golden retrievers and, and other people about, you know, that really wanted me to learn about an Italian Spanoni. You know, breeds of dogs I'd never seen before. So... I loved it. I mean, I I would love to do something like that again one day. That's awesome. So what is next for you? This book is just coming out, Tales of Owl. And what's next for you? Well, this book comes out on May 24th. And I actually start with a remote Zoom session with Powell's Bookstore on the 23rd. And then from the 24th of May through July 9th, I'm on a book tour. Mm -hmm. And the book tour goes up the West Coast of California, up as far as Sacramento, down the East Coast, as far as Miami, around the Midwest, and then the Great Lakes, pretty much, and then Pacific Northwest, and then San Diego, and then I'm home, and then I'm going to Europe. So it's going to be a really huge tour. Back to Italy, or where are you going? I'm going to be going to Switzerland and Austria to speak and also to be on Swiss television. So Awesome. Yeah, it'll be fantastic. And I'm hoping that there'll be an opportunity maybe to meet some mountain dogs, <laughs> Great Pyrenees or St. Bernard's. Is there another book in the works, another dog war in the book? I hope so. I hope so. But I don't know, because when I wrote this book about Al, that hadn't been my intention initially. It was just because I was so curious. Yeah. And really wanted to know how they trained. Were the dogs safe? Were the dogs harmed? Were the dogs pressured? I mean, these were, you know, I've seen great coaches and not great coaches. My sisters played on the U.S. water polo team. I managed the team. I saw great coaches on different teams. I saw horrible coaches. So I was really worried in a way that maybe these dogs are getting negative training. Maybe they're, Hmm. you know, if the dog doesn't want to do it, they grab the dog by the scruff of the neck and they force them. Hmm. Well, I didn't see anything like that. You know, it was always trying to show the dog, give them two, maybe three attempts at something, and then they'd back away and do something else where the dog could succeed. And I just started laughing when I saw that because I remember that's the way I was taught to swim. Like, if you can't get it after the second time, 
don't reinforce failure, <laughs> step back and do something else and what that you can do. And then another time, reapproach it. But the other thing that I thought was so fascinating was that the dogs would teach the other dogs what they knew. Not bad habits, <laughs> but good stuff. There was a dog named Moss who was a black Newfoundland, and she had a great reputation for being one of the top water rescue dogs in Italy. And she was working with Elle to try to teach her to become a water rescue dog. And she was a very patient girl. And it was fun to see them working together and to see Al start to get some of it, you know? Well, thank you so much, Lynn Cox. This has been awesome. The book is Tales of Al, available on bookstores everywhere. And we will have a link in the show notes. Thank you so much for being with us, Lynn Cox. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. Speaking with Lynn Cox has inspired me to go for a dip in the beautiful waters here in Hawaii. Maybe I'll bring Kanga along with me. And I want to remind you to pick up a copy of Lynn Cox's book. Again, the title is Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog. We will have a link to it in today's show notes. If you enjoyed our conversation today, I hope you will subscribe to The Long Leash and please tell a friend about the show. You can do that and get all the links on our website at longleashshow.com. And in addition to this podcast, our network, Dog Podcast Network, has a whole slate of podcasts for dog lovers. You can learn more on dogpodcastnetwork.com. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. <laughs>